Muy buenos días a todos. Les doy Good la morning to you all. I welcome you to our fifth technical railroad seminar. For those who see me for the first time, I'm a deputy trade uh, attaché in the British Embassy, Sonia pointed now, and together with my colleagues, we are really interested in the railroad sector. This morning, we will have specialists of the Department for Transport in Great Britain and uh, techn technical experts that will share the expertise all over the world and in the UK. We dedicate this seminar to the memory of John McMation and who passed away recently. John left an important footprint in several railroad projects in Argentina, the UK and South Africa. His uh, companions and workmates at the INTI really uh, like to remember him. Uh, we would like to ask you to please keep your microphones and cameras off and choose the language of preference, Spanish or English. Towards the end of the event, we will have a session for Q&A. You can send us the questions on the chat as the event unfolds. If there's any question that is not answered, we will then pass the questions to the speakers so that they can answer them. As last year, this year we will uh, be doing a uh, um, uh, we will be distributing books uh, of specialist books on the railway among all the attendees. And then we will uh, listen to the uh, ambassador. Buenos dias. Soy Chelsea Hayes, ambassadora británica en Buenos Aires. Es un placer dar comienzo a la quinta edición de nuestro ya tradicional seminario técnico ferroviario. La continuidad y cada vez mayor interés en este encuentro anual uh, demuestra que la herencia ferroviaria uh, británica no es solo histórico, uh, sino también presente y futuro. La pandemia ha afectado fuertemente al sector ferroviario y mi país no ha quedado al margen de esto. El gobierno británico le ha dado un, un fuerte apoyo al ferrocarril y continúa siendo para nosotros el medio de transporte más seguro y de menos emisiones. El Reino Unido es pionero en el desarrollo ferroviario. Y seguimos avanzando, construyendo nuevos y mejores... ...in rail development and we continue to make progress, building new and better rail systems while efficiently managing long-established networks. We also have a long tradition of sharing our expertise. Events like today's are... Uh, we have a long tradition, so events like today's are the ideal setting to discuss successes, mistakes and ideas that can be transformed into great projects in Argentina. Without further ado, I leave you at the hands of the specialists. We thank you, the Ambassador, for the opening words. And now we will listen from Ana Moriano from the Department for Transport in the UK that will tell us about how they define investments at the railway system. Ana is Portfolio Performance and Insights Lead on one of the largest capital delivery portfolios in Europe. She leads a team responsible for funding rail enhancement across England and Wales. This includes ensuring strategic alignment, developing metrics for detailed performance management and senior challenge. Also providing the authorities with reliable data on which to make the difficult decisions and ensuring overall affordability across the portfolio. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sonia. Um, Victoria, can we start sharing the presentation, please? Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everybody. Well, actually, it's probably good morning for most of you. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for the invitation 
we are always happy in the department to get the opportunity to collaborate in this way. So let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ana Moriano and I lead on the data and insights management of the rail enhancements portfolio at the Department for Transport. This means that I am responsible for data and funding management of the portfolio that includes all of the rail upgrades and improvement programs in England and Wales. So this is a portfolio of more than 16 schemes that add up to spend of around two billion pounds per annum that aim to add new functionality and indeed even whole new sections of railway to the network, which we refer to as enhancements. So I'm going to talk to you today about the way that we make investment in the railway. In this country, I'll start by setting out the landscape of the Great British Railway, the stakeholders and bodies involved in it, and the overall investment picture. Then I'll turn to a more detailed look at how we manage investment in enhancements, setting out the framework we follow to make our decisions. Then I'll talk about the kinds of priorities we aim to meet in those investments before finally talking briefly about some examples that we are currently managing. Can we go to the next slide, please? So in the Department for Transport, we are responsible for all of the railway in England and Wales. We are the central government department, which is responsible for setting policy and funding the vast majority of the railway. We set the priorities for spend and activity in England and Wales, and the Scottish government and their minister make similar decisions for Scotland's railway. But neither government is responsible for delivering those priorities. That falls to Network Rail, which is an arm length body, effectively a subsidiary of the government. Network Rail is responsible for <clears throat> running the day-to-day management of the railway, making day-to-day -day decisions and ensuring that it is able to do so safely. They are our primary delivery body of rail enhancements and they are crucially in charge of operations, maintenance and renewals, which are the other two categories of spend as shown at the bottom of the slide. So today we're mainly going to focus on enhancements as these are the discretionary investments Whereas operation and maintenance keep the railway running and renewals ensure that the assets are up to standard. So these standards are effectively set by an independent regulator, the Office of Rail and Road, the ORR. Everything has an acronym in rail. So they play a crucial part in ensuring that the railway as a whole is run safely and efficiently. They hold network rail to account for the work and they play a key part in setting the funding envelope for the railway. Another very interesting part of the regulator's role is ensuring that the services provided on the railway are in line not only with the government's priority, but also with the needs of the passenger and freight around the country. So services on the passenger side of the railway are mostly provided by private companies that are called the top box or the train operating companies, with freight being provided by freight operating companies on an entirely private basis. These are separate from infrastructure and network rail, and they work on contracts which are led periodically by the government to ensure that passenger services are provided. They play a key role in the enhancements as the majority of the benefits from the rail investments are realized through the provision of improved or additional service, which talks must agree to deliver. There are then some elements of the railway which are provided by third parties. These are normally significantly big projects, such as Crossrail, East West Rail, HS2, and HS1. And by their nature, these programs have significant risks and significant investment to manage, which make them appropriate for independent companies to deliver often on behalf of the government. Can we go to the next slide, please? So turning into a bit more detail on how we make investment, 
since the start of 2019, we have followed a policy called the Rail Network Enhancement Pipeline, the RNET, to manage our decisions and investment on enhancement. Prior to this, the enhancements funding and delivery was part of the five-year funding cycle that was regulated by the ORR, the Office of Rail and Road. And it was called the control period. So we are now in control period six, which runs from 2019 to 2024. So the ARTNET was created out of some real issues that we faced with rail enhancements in the previous control period. So projects with network rail had taken longer and cost more than we anticipated. So we developed a new investment approach that was designed to overcome those challenges. So we now take a multi-stage pipeline approach to enhancement that has allowed us to move away from that rigid five-year cycle and towards a rolling pipeline of investment. So decisions on enhancements are taken in a scheme by scheme stage by stage basis as schemes reach the appropriate level of maturity and demonstrate good business cases to continue. As you can see on the uh, diagram at the bottom of the slide, the ARTNIP has five stages with an increasing level of maturity at each stage as enhancement schemes move towards delivery. So those five stages are first determine where you identify the opportunity for the investment, which I will talk a bit more about on the next slide. Then it's develop where you consider the outcomes or benefits you want to achieve. Basically, what do I want to deliver? Then it's design where you establish the railway outputs to meet those outcomes. How am I going to deliver this? Third stage is design where you establish, uh, sorry, fourth stage is deliver where you, uh, where the solution is provided. At this stage, you should be able to answer, what am I going to deliver? Why am I delivering it? And how am I going to deliver it? And of course, at what cost? Then the final stage is number five, deploy, where the benefits are realized and effectively delivery of the scheme has been completed. So each of these stages, is preceded by a decision point where we consider the case for the scheme advancing to the next stage, where more is needed or if there is a better way of doing things. These decisions are built out of the business case, which are the documents that set out the rationale for the scheme and they require at each stage. So starting at the first one with the strategic outline business case, which looks at how the scheme fits in the wider strategic context, then for the design, for the design stage, we have the outline business case, and then the final business case, which sets out all of the required and assured information about the scheme at the delivery stage. Overall business cases consider things as the uh, wider economic benefits of the scheme, the specific railway demand, uh, they do an assessment of the revenue and costs, as well as, very essentially for us, value for money and affordability. So, crucially, these decisions are only about committing to the next stage of the pipeline. So this means that the government will never commit to complete a scheme until we have done the proper development and passed the proper decision points. This helps us ensure that the right scheme is being delivered at the right cost and in the right way. And it puts a priority on effective portfolio management and controls and requires effective and detailed insight into available portfolio funding, strategic priorities, risks, and forecasts. So, in making all of our investment decisions, we aim to achieve a balanced portfolio. This is both in terms of type of scheme to help maintain a healthy supply chain, the scale of the scheme so that not all of our investments are mega projects, allowing us to better manage the as a portfolio. 
and of course the regional split of investment. So balance does not necessarily mean that every region receives equal levels of investment. Rather, we aim to ensure that the railway continues to support economies and improve connectivity and service levels across the country. So the pie chart that you can see on your right shows the latest view of our forecast spend by region. And this is moving away from the historic spending trends, which have prioritized the Southeast and towards a greater level of investment in the North. Uh, next slide, please. So why is that? And what is driving this change? So historically, demand for rail in this country has exceeded the railway capacity, particularly in major cities and for commuting. So while we have always been keen to drive economic benefits, much of our investment has been in attempting to meet the continued growth of passenger demand by creating additional capacity, primarily in the southeast of England and London. So highlighted by recent events and the COVID-19 pandemic, this trend has been changing for some time. The slowdown in passenger growth, even before the virus struck, as more and more people move towards remote working. This has been shifting the focus of our priorities. And it has only been accelerated as we have witnessed a reduction in passenger traffic over the last couple of years. Our focus, which had been on capacity enhancing investment in the south of England, has now moved towards connectivity enhancing schemes, primarily in the north of England and the Midlands. This also reflects the wider government strategic priorities of economic shift. Within the pipeline itself, we are taking a strategic approach to prioritizing the portfolio. So first, we consider the safety and operational needs of the railway. We assess whether a scheme is critical for the safety and functionality of the railway, and then align the portfolio to the department's strategic priorities and consider how each scheme contributes to each of the strategies. So we have grow a level of the economy. What's the scheme's contribution to leveling up objectives, including regional split of focus? How do we improve transport for the user? So how is the scheme contributing to connectivity, to efficiency and modernization, to capacity objectives? And then the third one key is reduce environmental impact. How is the scheme contributing to decarbonization or to the environmental objectives? Then as far as the <clears throat> economic benefits, we have been following to assess what are these economic benefits. We have done so by following the five case model, as you can see at the bottom of the slide. This basically considers the strategic case, which is is your scheme supported by a robust case for change that fits within the wider public policy objectives? Then the economic case, does it demonstrate good value for money? The commercial case, is it viable? And the financial case, which looks at financial affordability and whether it is compliant with wider rules in public spending. And then the management case, which looks to see whether the scheme is achievable and deliverable. Come see the next slide, please. Then finally, I just wanted to show you some examples of the projects we are currently managing on the portfolio. All of these are a key part of the government's leveling up and build back better agenda. So first we have Restoring Your Railway, which is a 500 million pound fund to develop proposals to build or reopen lines and stations, reconnecting smaller communities, regenerating local economies, and improving access to jobs, homes, and education. So effectively, this fund looks at how small-scale investment on local communities that have limited opportunity otherwise. 
We have the Integrated Rail Plan, the IRP, that was announced last November. And it's a 96 billion pound package of rail investment that sets out the long-term plans for investment in the North and the Midlands and looks at who, how to best sequence and deliver major rail investments in the North and the Midlands so that the benefits are delivered to passengers and communities more quickly. And then we have the Transpennine Route Upgrade. This is one of the largest programs on network rail's infrastructure, and it's a significant part of our portfolio. This program aims to improve line speed, reliability and capacity between Manchester and York, uh, delivers environmental benefits through electrification of the route and improve accessibility at stations. Um, that is all for me. That's all I wanted to share with you today. Thanks again for the opportunity and I'm happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for your presentation. We will now listen to the different British companies here with us sharing their experiences and solutions. We will begin with Gary Elliott's presentation from Heard Rail Development. Hail Rail Development is a world leading supplier of life improvement and sustainable infrastructure products to the global rail sector. They have built an impressive capability in the manufacture of glued insulated rail joints. The facility in Doncaster has been established as best in class. This system provides a key instrument for active manage portfolio management. They have more than 40 years experience in this industry. He started as a Drotsman apprentice, uh, Gary, uh, the railway and general company in Nottingham, England. Uh, he has been a commercial director in different companies. Gary, you have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon and good morning, or should I say buenos dias. I'm going to talk to you today about one of our product lines. Thank you for the opportunity. This product line is born out of the United States and we are the global distributor for this product. It is mainly uh, invented by the Boeing company, the aircraft company in the United States for the protection of drilled holes in metal frames in aircraft and has been implemented for use on many applications. And the one we are really interested in is the application in rail. So the problem in rail is where we have drilled holes in rail. Now these holes are necessary where we want to join track. It's actually the weakest part of the structure and these holes will always contain defects which can be micro cracks from the drilling operation. Cyclical loading of the rail from the vehicles on the track and the thermal expansion and contraction due to the heat in the sun of the day can lead to a concentration of the stresses in the bolt hole, which leads to the initiation of cracks. Ultimately, this can lead to catastrophic failure, but more often it's speed restrictions and delays where the cracks are identified relatively early. But it leads to early rail replacement, rail breakages, and sometimes even fatal derailments. The solution for this problem 
is split sleeve cold hole expansion. The theory behind this is that the cold working of the material around the drilled hole extends the fatigue life of the hole. And in principle, a radial expansion of the hole takes the material at the edge of the hole beyond its elastic limit, whilst the material further away from the hole surface springs back to create a protective zone. Now this shields the hole from the cyclical loads and captures any cracks that want to propagate. So more than 50 years ago, Boeing developed this process for use in aircraft, but it's also employed in bridge protection. So you can get a 60 times life extension on a bridge defect by using this protective measure. It protects the full bore of the hold, not just the edge. And it's best in practice for this classification of defect. The application of this process in rail is relatively simple. And these next few slides and video show how the process is carried out. So first of all, the hole is measured for its size with a gauge. And then a split sleeve is inserted onto the mandrel, which is entered into the hole. A pulling tool pulls the mandrel through the hole, through the sleeve, and carries out the expansion of the surface of the hole. This small little explanation on the right hand side shows the actual representation of the stress razor in the hole once the sleeve is pulled through. Now this video goes further to explain the process. First of all, the hole is checked for its diameter. And it's checked in more than one dimension, so horizontally and vertically, to make sure that the hole is perfectly round. This allows the selection of the correct mandrel to be used in the process. This is uh, the mandrel and the mandrel is checked with a tolerance gauge because over time the mandrel does wear. So we check the mandrel size, slide the sleeve onto the mandrel, the split sleeve. In this case, it's 30 millimeter diameter. The mandrel is then passed through the hole to engage the sleeve. We make sure that the split in the sleeve is either at the three o'clock position or the nine o'clock position. The pulling tool is then engaged with the mandrel and the activating arm moved across to power the machine. You see the mandrel being pulled through the hole and that material there is the Teflon coating in the sleeve to aid the friction. The sleeve is discarded after use. It's a one-time sleeve. 
So a relatively simple process, the application of which has been tested in both laboratory and in the field by both the United States Department of Transport and also British Rail in the UK. Field trials in both markets provide evidence of benefit, which makes the holes last more than five times longer than holes that are not protected in this way. Processes used by asset owners around the world. The list here shows all of the people that are currently using the process. It is also on trial in some other territories. And the bottom list shows the contractors, the track work contractors who employ this process in the products that they make. And finally, in terms of benefit, it's a proven process. It's been used for more than 30 years. All network rail and UK manufactured product in rail has this process mandated by the rail authority in any of the holes used to join the rail. It's a cost effective system for providing the protection, preventing cracking in bolt holes. It's safe, reliable, and helps to benefit from increased actual loads and higher speeds, which tends to be the way rails are going. So as an example, in the UK, the high speed rail development for HS2 is going to lead to higher speeds, not necessarily higher axle loads, but it's quite common now to see a lot more speed and increased axle loads, which requires more service level from the rails that are employed. Thank you for your time. Gracias. Thank you for listening. And I'll hand back over to Sonia. Muchísimas gracias, Gary, por tu presentación. Thank you so much, Gary, for your presentation. Now we will listen Adam Nevin from Trelleborg. It is a center of excellence for polyurethane, specializing in polymers and composites of the next generation with demand for demanding applications in the rail. Situated in the Wildel Trelleborg Group, operating in over 50 countries with 120 manufacturing facilities and a turnover in excess of 3 billion, they can um, handle any technical requirement that may arise. Adam Nevin is the innovation lead and working at Trelleborg Applied Technologies. He obtained his doctorate in 2016 of highly functionalized nanomaterials. He continued with smart polymer materials at the Cardiff University. He now leads projects to deliver acoustic and electromagnetic controls and mitigation solutions in different applications and sectors. Adam, you have the floor. Thank you. Yeah. Buenos dias, everyone, and good day. Uh, I shall, I'm trying to share my screen. Here we go. Okay. Okay, so um, thank you everyone for your time. I'm going to talk on stray current and vibration mitigation and Trelleborg's um, efforts therein and lessons learned along the way. <clears throat> As mentioned, I'm part of Trelleborg Group, who are a polymer manufacturer, and we manufacture solutions for everything from space to seabed. 
and everything in between. So the background behind this, so as we all know, light rail is an incredibly instrumental method of providing low carbon transport and as such global investments in this area have been very large across the world and in the UK here we carry 282 million passengers per year uh, pre-COVID on light rail. Um, the issue however is that rail vehicles when the wheels roll along the track inevitably generate vibrations due to irregularities within the wheel or the rail um, and this can either expand outwards as noise or it can travel through the ground and into the surrounding areas as vibrations and it can become a real nuisance for nearby residents but also for sensitive sites such as hospitals. Furthermore, electrification of light rail, which is one of the main reasons why it can be such a low carbon transport system, can be problematic if there is not enough electrical resistance between the rails and the surrounding ground, leading to the return current leaking into the ground, which can be an issue from a safety aspect, but also from corrosion of embedded steel structures, such as pipes and cables. So what can we do about this? Well, on the noise side of things, there are numerous solutions that have been developed to attempt to mitigate this. Broadly, they fall into two categories, which either look at the interface between the wheels of the light rail and the rail itself, or between the interface between the rail and the surrounding environment. So you stop it from leaking out into the environment. If we look first at the interface between the rail and the wheels, as mentioned earlier, the main issue is the irregularities in the wheels. And as this rolls along the track, these bumps can essentially generate this vibration, which is then transmitted as noise into the surrounding environment. So uh, the numerous solutions to this involve basically high precision machining or regular reprofiling to minimize the irregularities, which is very beneficial from a capital expenditure or capex point of view, as there is a very low initial investment. However, this uh, basically needs to happen on a very regular basis or else the um, high precision machining will inevitably degrade over time and the noise will be generated. So there's a high operational expenditure on these solutions. So looking instead at a fit and forget solution, so something which can be put into place and then left there for the duration of the track lifetime, um, we look at um, basically noise uh, interfaces between the rail and the surrounding environment. So uh, the first of these is rail encapsulation, which uh, basically is highly effective and very simple to install, but comes with the negative of a very high capital expense. Furthermore, we can look at floating slab track, which is a similar type of um, mitigation, but in this instance has incredibly high upfront expense as well. So where Trelleborg uh, really looks to um, develop is within the rail boots mitigation. So these are low cost and very easy to install and depending on the elastomer used can actually offer reduced mitigation similar to the um, options above but with a much lower capital expenditure. And as you can see, the operational expenditure over the lifetime of the rail remains very low. It's fit and forget. So looking at these in a little more detail, to give you an idea of how they work. Encapsulated rail is essentially, as it says, a full encapsulation of the rail within the track. And what this does is it uh, isolates it from the surroundings um, and means that any generated noise or vibration doesn't propagate into the neighborhood. Um, the issue with this, as you can see, is there's a very large volume of polymer which needs to be cast around the rail to achieve this solution. Therefore, as mentioned earlier, flowing slab track is another alternative. So in this instance, you just look at isolating the track itself from the surroundings. So in this 
case, you have a thinner elastomeric bearing, which basically on which the track sits. This is very good because it offers excellent litigation. However, very high cost still and quite difficult to install and furthermore difficult to remove and replace if the elastomer degrades over time for any reason. So as mentioned, we look at the rail route. So a much smaller amount of polymer specifically focused around the rail itself to isolate this from the surrounding areas. This is very cost effective, very easy to do. However, you do get a lower amount of noise and vibration mitigation due to the fact that this is a not as um, thick solution. So what we've done is we've developed a floating rail system with an sacrificial beam, which enables incredible easy installation method. But also what we've done is provided additional elastomeric surrounding to the areas of high stress on the rail. This therefore actually means that this can be variable track stiffness and actually offer a similar level of noise mitigation to floating slab track. But in this instance, it is much easier to install as the boots can be fitted to the rail on site and um, put into the ground. Furthermore, this is a single pore solution as the sacrificial beams allow for precise alignment of the rail and then you, a single cast of concrete around the solution. So here it is in situ in uh, Australia. So we have this uh, currently being installed at the site of a nearby hospital due to the uh, high levels of vibration attenuation needed for their highly sensitive equipment. So the other uh, thing I mentioned was stray current. So what are the solutions around this? So again, there are three widely accepted solutions for stray current issues. Again, there is rail encapsulation, as, as you can imagine, by placing a very highly electrically resistive um, um, volume of polymer around the rail, this prevents the electrical current from leaking into the surrounding areas. So it's very effective, but as before, there is a high capital expense. So again, if we look at just coating the rail itself with a highly insulative uh, material, we can achieve this very reliable long-term electrical insulation, but there are issues as during, uh, during fitting or during maintenance, the coating might chip or degrade over time, which therefore leads to a rapid decline in the stray current mitigation. So again, Trelleborg has focused on the rail boot as a potential solution um, in combination with a polymeric coating. So what we do is we put a very highly electrically insulative coating on the rail first, which um, gives amazing electrical insulation, but then we cover this with a rail boot, which not only provides the noise and vibration mitigation mentioned in the previous slides, but also means that the polymeric coating on the inside is very well protected and offers a lifetime um, to match that of the rail itself. So here you can see um, the electrical insulative paint being applied to some rail near the site of a um, rail installation, and then the boot being fitted over the top of it. This is designed to outlast the life of the rail. So just to uh, summarize, essentially what we have is the great promise of embedded light rail um, in terms of carbon reduction and um, meeting uh, the needs of nearby passengers um, holds great promise, of course. Um, however, there is a great complexity when it comes to environmental impact assessments in the form of both vibration uh, mitigation and the stray current. So there are many mitigation strategies available and Trelleborg uh, focused particularly on the rail boot as a solution not only to uh, stray current mitigation, but also to noise and vibration and the floating rail system uh, that we have is also comparable to floating slab track in the levels of track stiffness achievable, however, a much easier method of installation. So furthermore, we also have a variety of um, other uh, noise and vibration mitigation solutions such as ballast mat, rail dampers, acoustic barriers to go alongside tracks uh, and so on. 
and we're happy to discuss any sort of issues that arise during the Braille construction planning. So all that's left is to say thank you for listening and thank you for your time. And if you do, do have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Adam, por tu presentación y gracias a todos por cumplir también con los horarios. Thank you so much, Adam, for the time. The next person is from Centim. de monitoreo remoto. Manuel es experto en monitoreo remoto e inalámbrico para ferrocarril. Control, monitoreo de talud y geometría de la vía. Eh, Manuel, tenés la palabra. Hola, Sonia. Gracias. Buenos días, buenas tardes a todos. Thank you, Sonia. Good afternoon to you all. Okay, thank you once again, Sonia. So basically, we are a UK based company, 15 years manufacturing wireless technology for everything that has to do with instrumentation and monitoring in several environments. Uh, one is the railroad. In this case, after working uh, together with Network Rail and listening to the issues and concerns, basically, we have designed two types of solutions for the problems. One is the uh, slope control and uh, monitoring, and one is the stability and geometry. How do we monitor the taludes? In the United States, there are various variables. In the majority, the age. There are many taludes that are more than 150 years old. Also, the geology and the structure of them are very variable. Por otro lado, también eh, la gran cantidad que tenemos de taludes, estamos hablando de cerca de 200.000 taludes y terraplenes, solamente en Reino Unido, y la gran mayoría de ellos es de difícil acceso. Son muy difíciles de llegar a ellos para hacer un monitoreo o un seguimiento del mismo. Por otro lado, también tenemos que tener en cuenta lo que sería el cambio climático y también últimamente eh, se está dando mucho el tema de invasión de materiales a la vía, ya sea... Caída de árboles. We are seeing invasion on the line. We see landslides and materials on the on the rails. We have this solution for slopes. It has to do with intelligent or smart monitoring. Here we see the main elements that we use for monitoring. We are going to do this. Here we see three basic elements. Here you see the wireless devices. These sensors are communicated wirelessly through radio. And you can see here the gateway down on the right through a fed through a solar panel where it is difficult access and we can have the system working with solar panel. We don't need to connect to the grid. And you see here below the gateway, this small camera. These are the main elements that we have for slope control and monitoring. And now we will see how the monitoring can be done. Here we have the node installed at uh, the same distance and we will see in the video now that there is no problem here with the slope. The sensors are communicating wirelessly, sending the data directly to this gateway, which is 4G sending the information to us. We have a camera also with a reading frequency that has been pre-established. Reading every hour, every 30 minutes or every 15 minutes, you decide. And this reports directly to the gateway, receiving the information in real time. Here we see everything is correct. The nodes are communicating in between themselves and 
the data goes to through the gateway to us. Here, there is no problem. There is full control at all times, and we obtain data of what is going on with that slow. We can have now the situation where a sensor moves, and with the smart monitoring system, you will see that the camera takes a picture that will be sent to our emails in our cell phones for us to see what is going on with the date, the day you see, and the hour we see, this is what we receive. There is some instability on the slope and we will see the image here. You, this image is sent directly to our cell phones. We will have our asset control. We know what is going on. We have the image and we see what happens almost in real time. We see what we are facing. And then the situation could become more critical and we can see there is a landslide. There is an actual movement of the land. So the sensors start coming down. They start taking more frequent, higher frequency of reading, they indicate the other sensors to start taking quicker uh, read, reads. The images are sent every 20 seconds and we know at all times what is going on. This way we can check if what is the decision to be made in this regard, if the train is coming, if this is the uh, tree and it's blocking uh, the path, we we can learn about what is going on of the at the very moment we have a thorough understanding of what is going on right there and here you see some images we've seen the videos but here you can see some other images from the camera well this is a day image 24 7 the sensors work 24 seven with no interruption with the reading frequency that you establish here you see the notes installed and this is a daylight image and on the right you have the nighttime image and the on right across you can see that there are other notes installed for monitoring the other slope on the other side of the rails. We can work 200. We can work with the nose, the camera and the edge hub on the land. As we see, we can easily cover 100 to 200 meters in a day. And we can cover the area very quickly. Why am I saying this? Because we have a practical case with an urgency. In this case, the embankment came down. We were able to provide a rapid response, installing this in less than 24 hours to have better monitoring of the area. Then, some practical cases, 2021, the work done in Kent and Sussex in the UK, we covered 20 kilometers past 36 locations in four months. We ended having almost 6,000 meters, 222 cameras and 111 hubs or gateways that we use. In this case, we did this, we, we, with all of the material and network ra uh, rail, we um, used and applied our technology. And now we will see about remote monitoring and wireless telemetry for stability and geometry of the tracks. We, let's see what do we mean with wireless remote monitoring. As you can see here on the slippers, we see the sensors installed with no cables, no cables in between sensors, wireless communication that goes 
directly, remotely to the gateway. You don't need to take measurements uh, where uh, physically, that is, nobody needs to go there and do anything. This is only installed and configured, and it's up and running as from there with continuous, periodic, and automatized measurements rem done remotely, checking 24-7 at all times. Here we see the behavior of the asset without needing to go there and be there in person. What is the value of wireless sensors? They are very easy to install for the geometry of the tracks. No cable sensors directly. They are glued to the slippers pre-configured as from the factory. You don't need to do any configuration or setting up when you are there on the field. Security, safety, you don't need to go there to the rails. The sensor is doing everything for you. You don't need human presence on the trucks. We know that if we know that there are issues uh, happening, you don't need to send anybody at, at night or in bad weather. And they are almost free of maintenance. It does not require any regular or periodic cleaning. Internal batteries, if you are working every hour, they last from 2 to 15 hours. We're talking about the useful battery for the sensor that can, of course, be replaced. And all, we also have data almost in real time. Every 10, 15 minutes, half hour, or every hour, you determine the monitoring frequency. Here we will see now, we, we have seen the section for the slope. Now we will see the sensors for monitoring the tracks themselves. We have the tilt sensors, triaxial, integrated triaxial. We have no external antenna. It is glued to the sleeper. The resolution is very accurate. We detect very, very small movements in the sensor and it is weatherproof IP66, IP67 and 68. We have no problem with rain or snow against other measurement methods. Uh, this does not get dirty. Uh, we don't have the problem that PRISM has because we are not affected at all by the weather. And in this if case, we you are taking measures every 20 to 30 minutes, the battery will uh, and the sensor will last for more than 10 years. And as we have seen, you need to wrap up, it's about time. All right, let me go faster here. Thank you, Sonia. Here we have the gateway. It is the LTE 4G flat mesh. Here we can connect with the solar panel, which is the most used option. We have temperature sensors. This can be welded or glued directly. It's a temperature sensor. It's an RTD node. And here we can see the architecture very quickly. You see how the sensors communicate in a mesh manner. It's a flat mesh. It's intelligent monitoring, communicating directly with the wide gateway. You can use the cell phone, the ethernet, manual data download, or we have NDSC to download directly by means of a device that is provided for that end. Sun energy is the most used. You can also use external batteries or connect it to the grid. Well, we can uh, take different measurements, the length, the tilt, 
there is no more time, but you can send the presentation for everyone to see the videos and everything you have to share. Here you see how quickly we can install it. We, this was a practical case. We have a software that we provide to you with um, all of the web monitoring possibilities. Here you have the customized site images to show the data. You can see all of the alarms, no limit of users. You can connect as many people as you want to see this data. We provide a easy download of the software. You can send the data to an, uh, through an API or FTP to a third party or a third viewer. Here we have the different alert levels. You can receive an email or SMS. We determine the different thresholds or alerts with the traffic light system. And according to that, we allocate the person in charge of checking what is going on or, and monitoring. Yeah, we see web monitor charts. And if you require more information, we have all of these professional information provided. We have our website where you can click on the different elements and see the description and their use. We have also leaflets that we provide on the railroad system that have a more generic explanation, but you can contact uh, our page or myself, M. Fernandez at sensive.com. And we can discuss anything you may require. I will be very pleased to assist you. It, smart infrastructures, when the land moves, we want to control that so that trains don't have to stop. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, he will remain available because we already have a few questions for your system. Now we will listen uh, Robin from LPA Lighting System, which is a high reliability LED lighting systems for rail rolling stock. It provides cost-effective solutions to improve reliability, reduce maintenance, and improve life, co uh, life cycle cost. They provide LED tubes, LED smart lighting, LED modules, LED luminaires, door status lights, reading lights, ambient light, and USB chargers. Uh, Robin Capel Dunn, sales and marketing director. He's got a master's degree in international business, has been working with LPA since 2004, developed um, the market in Europe and Australasia. Robin, you have the floor. Very good to be here with you. So I will share my screen now. Okay, so I'm here to talk about rail rolling stock uh, LED tubes uh, today. So that's to increase um, your fleet reliability, power saving and uh, future proofing. So you're probably all aware that uh, traditionally for um, rail interior lighting, we tend to use or we tended to use fluorescent tubes. Nowadays, we tend to use LED, uh, light, LED lighting. So um, this has been used for the last uh, 50 or, or 60 years, uh, but there's a development at the moment in that they will be banned from September 2023 uh, in the EU, uh, but also it's starting to happen also in the US and I'm pretty sure in uh, South America as well. So this is to um, obviously um, decrease all the power consumption uh, they are very energy efficient. This is something you see in your home, in your in your, your houses, uh, but they're now applying that to all other industries. So what that means, this, uh, this ban from 2023, is that the fluorescent tubes you are currently sourcing for spares, uh, they will quickly become very hard to source um, and obviously uh, more expensive as stocks deplete. So this is why we're trying to um, uh, 
make all our customers aware of this. And now is a good opportunity to assess uh, your fleets, what type of tube or fluorescent tube uh, you need, the requirement, and if need be, conduct a trial just to check uh, that you're happy with the, with the result. So this is a, a short overview of our LED tube. So it's a drop-in replacement LED tube. So it it's, uh, drops in as uh, a fluorescent lamp. Uh, it's very high reliability LED and driver. So 110,000 hours, that would equate to about 10 to 12 years of service life. Uh, it's got built-in drive electronics, so you don't need any external ballast or, or driver. It's all built within uh, the tube here, and I'll explain the different uh, voltages that we, uh, we have. It's a perfectly diffused light, so there is some complaint sometimes, or there has been in the past, about LEDs being a little bit harsh, or you could see the luminous points. That, that doesn't happen because we've got this polycarbonate diffuser, which is specifically designed to diffuse the LEDs, so it's completely uniform and homogeneous. Um, so we've got two adjustable end caps uh, at each end, so you can rotate them at plus 19 degrees. And the reason for that is that it allows you to orient the tube, to orient the light where you need it, which tends to be toward the passenger. Um, so that's um, a very a good feature. It's about 65,000 hours to L70. So the term L70 means that if today, on your table, for example, you have 100 lux um, of light level. Uh, after 65,000 hours, you would have 70 lux. That's what the L70 means. So you've reduced your light output by 30%. So it's perfectly usable for many, many more years, but it's just that the light output has reduced a bit. And uh, one of the key benefits, of course, is the 50% plus power saving. Ease of installation. So I've put here a little diagram of um, the uh, existing uh, configuration with your fluorescent lamp. So typically in your train, you would have either 110 volt supply or 24 volt supply, then a lamp ballast, or they call it inverters, which then drive each fluorescent lamp. Now, obviously, the LED tube replaces the uh, fluorescent lamp here. You then need to bypass this ballast here. So it, this doesn't exist anymore. It can be removed. It becomes redundant. And you can then just supply each end of the tube or just one end um, that uh, we offer both, uh, both solutions. So that's all explained in our data sheet. In terms of product range, so we try to really um, have a range for about 95% of the market. So with the picture you're seeing here, uh, we cover about yeah, 90 to 95% of uh, our customers needs. So we've got the T5 here, which are the, the narrower, uh, much smaller diameter tube, the T8 tube here. Uh, this is a, called a 2G11 and a 2D lamp. And we offer them in the, the usual uh, rail voltages. So that tends to be 24 volt, 110 volt, or DC, of course, or 230 volt AC. So again, with those three voltages, that covers about 90% of the market. We do some slightly different one, like 36 volt uh, for Switzerland, or 72 volt for the French market, for example. Uh, but those three are uh, tend to cater for most needs. In terms of color temperature, you still have, so when you buy a fluorescent lamp, you have the choice between cool, natural, and warm white. So we still offer this range with the LED tube, where you see here warm white, natural white, cool white. So we are able to offer uh, any color, color temperature required. And this really uh, depends. In Scandinavia, uh, they tend to prefer something warmer to counterbalance, obviously, the uh, lower temperatures. But probably in South America, you might be quite happy to have a cool white to counterbalance the, the heat. So that um, tends to be a geographical uh, decision. Um, power saving. 
so typically, as I said, it, it's 50% uh, uh, plus of power savings. So it depends on the length of the tube. We do a number of length from 600 millimeters all the way to 1800 millimeters. And you can see uh, we get up to 67% power saving. That's the, the, the maximum out of the range. And what it allows you to do is you can double your emergency lighting operating time. So when the interior lighting goes on emergency mode because there's either an accident or something happens, uh, the emergency circuit kicks in. And with fluorescent lamp, obviously you, you would get half the duration that you would get with the LED tube because of this, um, because of this power saving here. So uh, we work in a rail industry and obviously there's a lot of safety uh, rail standards to comply with, which are well, we are well aware of. We've been working in the rail industry for about 35 years. So uh, we've got all the DC input voltage reversal, non-destructive uh, input transient protection and the voltage protection, built-in multiple LED circuit redundancy, um, power supply interruption for the EN5155, uh, no mercury content, of course, environmentally friendly. Um, so in terms of, uh, I didn't quote all the rail standards, but it goes without saying that we comply with all the EMC, which is electromagnetic compatibility, uh, shock and vibrations, and smoke and toxicity, all the nice standards we, uh, we have in our good old rail industry. In terms of references, uh, so we've supplied LED tube all around the world, really, but I'm just putting some of the, the latest and the bigger uh, references. So in Singapore, we're currently going through refurbishment for about 5,000 tubes. Uh, Australia is a big market as well for us. So we are supplying 6,000 tube uh, for down ADR rail for Sydney. We work with our agent in Sweden, so we supply some LED tubes for uh, Bombardier Regina, which is um, um, it's an intercity train around uh, Stockholm and other cities. Uh, again, we've won a very large uh, order for Oslo Metro for about 7,000 tubes. Then the UK is obviously, this is our home market. Uh, so we have a, a very, very good footprint uh, here, good brand awareness. So we have supplied so far about 45,000 tubes uh, in, a, there, in, a, in a range of uh, uh, different tube types. Uh, in Austria, so we're working with Bombardier and the local operator OBB with 7,000 uh, LED tubes. So, in summary, it, it's really um, a quick win uh, because it's a fairly low cost product. So this is a product we manufacture in China, but it's to our design. So uh, we, we then test it, of course, before we ship it anywhere. And it fits existing lighting configuration. Uh, it is uh, easy to install, as you saw from the, the diagram before. Uh, you have about 50% power consumption. You increase re the reliability as well. I mentioned uh, about 12 year service life that compares to about one to two years for a fluorescent lamp. You also double the emergency lighting operating time. So that's uh, in terms of safety, that's something not to, uh, to ignore. Uh, fully rail compliant without saying all the shock and vibration, EMC, uh, smoke and toxicity and the rest. We have full type test reports uh, available in English and in Spanish. Uh, and most importantly, it's about future proofing your rolling stock fleet because within the next 18 months, you will not be able to source those fluorescent lamps or, or if you do, they will be very expensive and you may not be able to get the, the volume and the range uh, required. So I've tried to make up a little bit of time uh, from the, the pre previous presentation, but this is our contact uh, details here. So this is me, uh, but uh, we also work, we've got a brand new uh, partnership with our local agent Ezekiel Sicardi, who is attending this um, presentation as well. 
and we have all data sheet presentation translated in Spanish already, so we'll be very happy to share that with you. And this is it from me. Many, eh, muchas gracias, Robin, por esta presentación y por cumplir también con el tiempo. Avanzamos un poquitito. Eh, a continuación, escucharemos a Phil Thank Morgan. you, Robin, and thank you for being on time. Now we will listen to uh, Railroad. Railroad is a new a small consultancy group with primary focus on freight transport, including intermodal and bulk activities. It specializes in economic analysis, project development, operational and commercial planning. It has contributed in interface uh, rail operations, and in and terminal cargo processing. Phil Mortimer has worked in the transport sector, including international maritime aviation and rail, covering planning, operational, and commercial roles. In addition, he has worked with national and international funding agencies on uh, transport technology and operation projects, including new rail vehicles. He's also worked with UK and European academic groups on logistics projects and the development of new rail freight services. He is director of small R&D companies centered on new rail and road freight vehicle technologies and other activities around food rail interface. Phil, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon from very sunny UK. Muchísimas gracias y buen día desde, o buenas tardes, desde el Reino Unido, okay. en una tarde muy soleada. Um, I, what I will do, I, I don't intend to read through these slides in detail, I will summarize them, I think that's the best thing to do, otherwise we'll all suffer from death by PowerPoint. This is going to be effectively a scene setting exercise, the context is the implications uh, for rail for net zero. Um, it's not just Argentina that's impacted by this, but other countries as well. So the initial focus was and relevance was Argentina, but a lot more comes from that. Go to the next slide, please. Just in summary, reading through this lot, the, the key issue is, is what is the implication of net zero commitments in relation to rail's future operations and capability, particularly traction. Um, diesel has some limitations in terms of uh, where it goes from here. Is fuel going to be economically available? That's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting uh, position to look at. The, the carbon position is a big new driver and it needs to be sort of taken on board by decision makers as to what the implications of that really are. So who decides what they're deciding upon? More of the same is no longer a tenable option if carbon reduction is realistically going to be achieved. So some key investment decisions which will be made by all railway administrations, private, public, around the, around the world are going to be uh, forced to take some of these decisions in, in, a, in a different way. Uh, more of the same is not a tenable option in my view. Next new slide, please. So again, just in summary, how is new asset acquisition currently looked after? How, who, who does it? What do they do? And this includes asset disposal or an option I'll come back to later on about remanufacturing because that might be an intermediate position that railways could look at and take up. Uh, it doesn't have to be a totally new build, new acquisition and get rid of the old. So the key question is what is planned and why? A key question also that flows out of this is is electrification a viable and credible option? Um, it's it's a, a high cost option. It, it can take a lot of time as well. But it's a key question for rail as to where it goes from here. There also there's the issue of a transition phase from the current position using diesel traction and some electrification to a much wider spread. So next slide, please. There's obviously some, some concerns over the long-term use of diesel traction. In the UK, for example, there are rules now in place to get rid of diesel uh, passenger operation by 2040. The full implications of this need to be thought through. Hydrocarbon fuel availability, it's already expensive. The Ukraine situation has not helped with indications of rocketing fuel prices. Alternatives, 
Some of these are not yet realistic to replace existing rail assets in terms of performance and capability. Uh, and even with, with road-based alternatives, some of those are, some of the claims being made look highly questionable. So is electrification uh, a credible option? Is it, is it feasible in countries such as Argentina and elsewhere? Um, rail is an energy efficient option, uh, but it needs to be doing more by translating that to energy efficiency into commercial situations. Next slide, please. So the, the, jumping down to point three on that, I think the, the others are, are important, but that is a key one. Are shippers, the, the movers of freight, are they the key drivers in all this? Are they going to be insisting on green transport in the future? Low emissions, zero emissions even. So that has implications for the future acquisitions of traction assets and how these are managed. And the other key thing is, could rail uh, as a network or in a national network accept more traffic coming from other modes, road in particular, onto the network. Exploiting green credentials is one thing, realistically accepting that traffic is another. And again, this, this raises the issue of the management of transition phases. Next slide, please. So this, we need to summarize on, on all this, how to approach this issue. How do we measure success? Is the carbon reduction going to be measured accurately? And what does it really mean? And how do the railways themselves measure success in terms of market share, profitability gains, cost reductions, and just generally making rail a more attractive option using the assets in terms of traction and rolling stock that it currently has. So there are options within the bulk sector, intermodal and general rail freight. I'm, I'm not mentioning passengers at the moment, that's a more specialist area, but I think for the moment, the primary focus is on the freight. Next slide, please. Rail traction options, they are key assets. There's no question about it. Without it, rail just doesn't work. So we have to look at what can be achieved moving from the current situation into the future where carbon issues will be dominating. Again, come down to point three, the remanufacturing of existing resources. This is an option which has been exercised in various parts of the world. And I'll come on to some examples later. Um, where existing traction is reworked, remanufactured, and put back into service as a very cost-effective way of deferring capital expenditure and possibly being used in a, in a transition phase. There's UK expertise in this option to be explored. It's also done uh, by, by the American and Canadian companies as well. Importing key traction equipment, uh, particularly from places like China, has some strategic implications. Uh, I'm not suggesting these are, are malicious, but they do raise risks of excessive reliance uh, from overseas suppliers uh, for design, spares, support, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Next slide, please. And if you're going to go for uh, new acquisitions or rebuilding, all these components here are relevant and basically need to be sort of drawn in into any sort of activities undertaken and financed. I don't think like for like replacement is a credible option that should be, be resisted as much as possible. But net zero does impose some real, real limits as to what can be done. Next slide, please. So how does this all fit together? Does it present rail with a huge opportunity to recast what it does? and how it can do it? And the answer to that is yes, but how? And I think I'm now I need to move on to that. Next slide, please. The intention needs to be a review of the current strategy for traction acquisition and deployment. Is it the best fit? Is it working properly? Does it work to best effect in terms of competitiveness and commercial activities? Does the expertise really exist at a national, at a regional, local level uh, to do that? This is where rail growth comes in. Rail growth has the expertise, it's had the experience, and it's been involved in these types of programs in terms of ac uh, acquisition of new, new assets and also rebuilding, remanufacturing. Next slide, please. This is what we're suggesting, how it might be done. It's fairly straightforward. It's fairly uh, orthodox. 
but basically we're looking at scenarios where net zero is a key driver and the Im impact of market requirements is also coming in as well. The shippers are looking for green credentials, green performance. That's coming through in UK freight markets and elsewhere. So we believe there's expertise in this within our own organization um, and we're well positioned to undertake this type of activity. We also separately do carbon modeling to just get a, a, an overview of the current scenario of, of basically how, how carbon uh, emissions are, are, are generated and how they, how they are picked up during the transition. So let's say from a container moving through a port to a terminal to an inland destination by road or rail. We've got some, some very detailed analysis of that. Next slide, please. This is an example of some traction equipment that was being used and modified for an alternative use. This was a, a, a mainline passenger locomotive capable of fairly high speeds, now being reworked and remodeled. Uh, it, it still remains as an electric locomotive, um, but it's used for freight. So it just demonstrates what can be done using the existing assets and reassigned. And those are quite cost effective. Uh, ironically, just before the Ukraine crisis, the, the operator of this particular type of train um, put all these locomotives into store because electricity prices had gone through the roof and they reverted to diesel traction, which is something of an irony. But it's, uh, you know, that is a, a, a position we're going to have to accept that in, the whole energy position is somewhat volatile at the moment. Next slide, please. Ways forward. I think doing nothing is not a viable option if we're going to face net zero aspirations full on. Uh, so there's an overall strategic position needs to be established and look at new acquisitions and modification of the existing fleet and really get the full implications of net zero fully accommodated. And basically, how will success in all this be, be measured? Is it commercial repositioning, more volume, more revenue? The carbon savings also need to be drawn into the evaluation. Now, I'll turn to some further examples of Next slide, please. Of, of traction uh, adaptation. This is a locomotive formerly deployed on channel tunnel type traffic uh, in the UK, now being used for domestic freight services. Next slide, please. These are some real golden oldies. Passenger locomotives introduced 50 plus years ago, still in frontline service, now used for freight. They have been modified. And quickly, next one, please. That's just a, a diesel engine being remated re with its uh, locomotive. Next one, please. That's it going into a locomotive under remanufacture. Those locos have also been around for a very long period of time. Next one, please. That's also an older locomotive being remanufactured. And finally, some other examples outside the UK. Next one, that's in the Baltic States. That's a US loco. Um, Sorry, next Bill. final one. Okay. If you can that's, wrap up, we are more or less yeah, yeah. time. I said, I, that's the last one. That's a, a general motor locomotive adapted and, and, and re reworked. Um, thank you for that. That's the contact details of who we are. Um, hopefully that's been of some interest. It's a complicated and wide subject. Uh, apologies for having to canter through it at, at high speed, but uh, hopefully it's, a, it's a generated some interest. Thanks. Muchísimas gracias, Phil. Eh, y por último, vamos a Thank escuchar. you very much, Phil. And lastly, we're going to listen to Jason Randall. Voice of Phil is a large uh, international company with over 50,000 employees. Historically, the company was based on steel, and steel is still an important part of the business. Regarding intelligent infrastructure, it administers and it executes this from the UK. Jason has 10 years of experience working on the control and automation, both in regarding engineering and uh, management. He has experience on road, uh, railroad, maritime and air transportation focused on automation and safety. Jason, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you. Um, I can't turn my video on for some reason. It says that uh, the host has stopped my video, so uh, perhaps that could be rectified quickly. Can you try again, please? Maybe you can yes. now. Uh, no, it says the host has stopped it. Okay. 
Okay, maybe I can just share my <clears throat> share my desktop. Let's go with that. Okay. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So unfortunately, you can't see me, but maybe that's good for, for some of you. So um, my, uh, my name is Jason Randall. I'm the VP for customer management here at Foster Alpina. Um, we are a large company with uh, in total over 55,000 employees, but here in the UK um, and working with the signaling side of the business, uh, we have 7,000 employees. Um, traditionally, we are a steel company, um, but have many divisions within the business, one of which being asset monitoring. Uh, so we have over 160 years of experience in this um, and uh, in nine locations across the world just for the signaling side of the business. What we stand for as a business is mobility. Um, I'll allow people to, to go through these slides in detail later. Um, there's, Sorry, there's no Jason, need for me to... Can you use yeah. the full screen, please? Uh, I am on full screen. Okay, we can see all your, your screen. Not the, the full screen for the presentation. Okay, hold on. Okay, we, we can still see all the slides on our side. Is that any better? Uh, mm, well, we see all your your screen, but uh, okay. Uh, if you cannot uh, put it full screen, well, uh, let, let's so follow. For me, it's full, for me, it's full screen. Okay, okay, no problem. Thank you. Okay. Um, innovation. So we we are a very much an engineering focused business, and of course sustainability as well. So we have uh, quite an in depth care for people and the environment, um, especially looking after our staff very well, and uh, ensuring that all of the resources that we can get our hands on are sustainably sourced. What we can monitor uh, and what our, our current monitoring capabilities are is level crossings, points heating, generators, uh, turnout, so electric, hydraulic, pneumatic or manual, signaling power, flood detection, track circuits, earth leakage and rail temperature. We monitor all of these within our strategic business areas of mixed traffic, high speed traffic, freight, and also urban traffic, including undergrounds around the world or metros as they're known, as well as very light traffic for um, things like local trams in city centers. Why do we use condition monitoring? Well, there's four challenges that most parts of the industry face. Uh, one of them is being on-time performance, which we can increase quite significantly. Safety, making sure that uh, maintenance is carried out without trains on those sections of track. And we have systems in place for those as well to ensure that the safety of the workers and also the passengers is kept as high as possible. Reducing maintenance costs significantly. This is where we really strive as uh, we can make sure that the, the, the teams that carry out the maintenance are only going to areas that need maintenance rather than going there just to check. So we are just checking all day long every day. Um, and then we call the maintenance team to site when it is needed. And the availability of possession. It goes, falls completely. So. Um, these are all very key points as to why you would look at monitoring your assets on track. If we take ARPC in Australia, we have seen, or they have seen, about a 60% reduction in failures on all of their turnout. This has been since installing our monitoring system. So they have seen quite a significant reduction in downtime and then it, it then increases the availability of the network to the train operators. 
this is the same for network rail and this graph I really like because the yellow and the red is us if you like um, points again points failures have reduced significantly up to 50 percent in some areas of the network sorry, red, sorry Jason um, you your presentation is frozen so we are still in the third slide um, maybe could you please uh, stop yeah, we, were, we weren't seeing that. Could you go to slideshow, please, and stop the presenter view? Let's see if that works. Hold on. It might be easier if I just didn't share my entire screen. Is that any better? Uh, can you change slides? Yes, now it's better. Perfect. Yes, thank you. Okay. It seems sharing the application work. Okay, so apologies for that. Um, this will obviously be available at the end. Um, I guess you didn't see um, some of these slides, so I'll very quickly go through those. Here I was talking about the, the four and main advantages to monitoring your assets on track. And this was the network rail slide that I was talking about here. And as you can see by the, the yellow in this graph, this is the amount of points failures they've had. And as you can see, it's fairly, fairly consistent until we hit the intelligent infrastructure program. And again, the same with signaling. So this is signal failures. Again, since putting the intelligent infrastructure program in, this has fallen considerably. So um, we have, practically halved the amount of failures seen on track as we can predict the failures before they happen. Um, how do we do that? Well, we use what we call Roadmaster, which is our software that analyzes all of the assets with on track. This gives an overview to the customer, generating heat maps of issues. This is useful during things like storms, where we can see there's been particularly bad parts of the infrastructure that has been damaged or needs maintenance. Um, here we can see, this is what our monitoring looks at. So we look at what is a normal, what usually happens. So if we take the bottom right graph here, this is a set of points, how they're moving and swinging over. And we can see that there is an obstruction due to the clutch slipping in this case. And these will generate alerts within the software. They can text, email, however the customer wants that information displayed to them. We look at long-term trends, we analyze the data, and in return, we generally give the customer about a 50% uptime on all of their assets. Obviously, we can't predict an animal getting stuck in a set of points or something being dropped in there from workers on the line, but maintenance failures we can predict. So whether that be not enough grease or a motor starting to failure, uh, a motor starting to fail, we will look at the performance of the motor, its current being drawn, the harmonics of the motor, and we can see a deterioration over time. Sometimes things like the brushes on the motor Coming to end of life, we can see that, predict it, inform the customer. This is a great graph. This shows you essentially that um, the when an asset is installed as new, it's in the green, it's considered a, in good condition. Once it falls into this orange band, we then say maintenance needs to be carried out and you have a maintenance window. After that, you then fall into a failure mode, at which point the network is unavailable to the customer. So we alert during the amber part of that curve. That's it for myself. Um, hopefully that's quick enough to make up for some time that you guys have lost by the sounds of it. If anybody would like any further information, you can contact me directly or you can go through the channels of the Vostalpine website. We have offices around the world. So 
we can speak your your local language in in your local country so if anybody has any questions please let me know now thank you very much jason we are going now okay. for yeah Brevemente con, con, cuento un poquito. Muchas gracias, Jason. Y, y, y la presento a Victoria. Que no te... So I introduce uh, Victoria. I hadn't introduced Victoria before. She will be in charge of the Q&A session. If you have more questions, you can write them on the chat. And if not, we can do with the questions that you've made so far. I will start with a couple of questions for Anna. Uh, Anna, there were two questions for you. The first one is, how do you prioritize the regional authorities' interests? And the second one is, how do you select the rail administrative authorities? Okay, so I'll, I'll start with the second. That's going to be quite quickly. So I'm, I'm not an HR expert, so it's very difficult to have the detail of that. What I can say is that both the department and network rail are public bodies and so all of so we, we are losing you could you maybe turn off your camera and um, please jason can you stay on mute thank you it says this is going to be the same impartial recruitment process that is more uh, difficult and requires more scrutiny as the grade is higher. Um, the, I think there was something about stability. So as, as far as stability is, as any other civil servant, we have our performance review on a regular basis. There's, um, there is a process in place to deal with anything that just doesn't meet the expectation. So. Uh, I'm afraid that's kind of all the detail I have, but I'm happy to pick it up if you need any more detail on how any of this works. Then uh, this first question, how we prioritize regional interests. So any enhancement scheme that seeks funding from the department will have to follow the same process, the same investment framework that I, uh, that I explained in my presentation, the RNIP. So those schemes that enter the pipeline can be sponsored by any party. So it could be private party, it could be political interest, it could be a, a member of the parliament, a local authority, anyone can sponsor the scheme and it can enter at any stage, as long as they can prove that they have a strong business case, that they can demonstrate good value for money and that they have the adequate level of maturity for that stage. Uh, so as an overall, the role of the portfolio for us, there is a number of schemes that are going to seek funding and the government cannot fund all of these schemes. So how do, do we decide this? So all the elements that I just said, but also as a portfolio, we need to <clears throat> look at the bigger picture. We need to look at all of the schemes. So anything that goes through and receives funding from the government needs to provide not only a good case, but a better case than all the other schemes. So we, in line with Network Rail and the department, we set the priorities and we just need to make sure that we have a balanced portfolio that is delivering in all of these priorities. Other than that, it, it any scheme, no matter who's sponsoring it, goes through the same process. Thank you very much for your answers, Anna. Um, we have another question for Robin from LPA. Um, what certifications under railway, electronic and lighting regulations do these products have? Robin, if you're yep, there. Yeah, I'm here. So they comply with uh, all rail standards, really. So it's, uh, this, for example, the EN 13272, which is a public transportation elimination standard. So it's the, the amount of lux level you need to achieve and the uniformity. But you also have all shock and vibration standards, uh, EMC, which is electromagnetic compatibility. 
uh, and uh, also all fire standards. So uh, we tend to use EN45545, but we can use other, um, we have other standards for the American market as well, if need be. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I guess so. <laughs> um, now we have a couple of questions in Spanish for Manuel. I will turn into Spanish. Manuel, te queríamos hacer... Manuel, we wanted to ask you three questions. First one is, what is the relationship of, between manual and automatic notes? Can you repeat the question? What is the relationship of the sensors with automatic and manual systems? I'm not clear with the question. What we do automatically are the measurements. In that regard, it requires no manual intervention. It is, uh, we're talking about automatic readings, automatic measurements. We do not work with people. We don't require um, manual readings. Even if there is a blockage or there is, a, it's dirty or it's no, there's no, we have no problem. We, it requires no manual readings at all. It is all through optical systems. The question was not very clear. I believe I'm answering the, to the point. If somebody wants to reformulate the question, you can go ahead. Second question how the tilt meters are fed electrically speaking. Yes, tilt meters have an internal battery. Each sensor has an internal battery. As I said before, if we read every hour, 24 hours a day, it will last from 12 to 15 years. Lithium batteries that will be replaced after those 12 or 13, 15 years of use for each sensor. All right, you can activate your camera. I, I'm pleased to do so. Detection of movement. Is that shared with the train uh, conductor and to the command center or there is an automatic interruption of the system? We work with our software that will warn an alert, warn you with an alert with a text message. And we're working with here in Spain with a project, the DIF and the Generalitat of Catalonia with projects where we sent a signal, pretty basic, a message with a one or a zero saying it's okay or something is happening there. So we are sending, we're making progress in this regard if what you want is a signaling for that asset that is being, that we monitor to know if this is pretty basic for the time being, but we have been working with projects in this regard. Thank you so much, Manuel. Any question, please contact uh, him directly. There is a question that says, how much is the railway's share of CO2 in transport in the UK? Do you know? Uh, it's, it's very low. Um, I mean, I, th I think it's about, it, it's very low single digits. It's about three to 4%. It's very low indeed, but you know, it's still a significant amount. It can be reduced, no question about it. Um, electrification takes that out because um, you're, you're not emitting at the point of use. Okay, thank you, Phil. And the last question that we have is for Jason. So the company is so large, and so there are small co customers. Uh, do you have any small, smaller customers than larger networks? Absolutely, yes, we do. So we have customers such as Network Rail here in the UK or Osrail in the Australia, the same in America, but we also have very small network operators um, such as manufacturers who have only two to three miles of track, um, five kilometers of track, that sort of length. And we monitor their assets um, because they're moving food 
and perishable materials. So they want to ensure that their network is available to them so that they can get out onto the main networks. So we have customers of varying sizes. Okay, thank you, Jason. And um, sorry, we have another one question for Gary. Gary Elliott, there is a question that says, um, in simple terms, what is the advantage of performing this process on both hosts? I don't know if you can join. Sure. The uh, advantage is extending the life of the holes. So simply the hole will deteriorate over time through the cyclical load on the rail. And doing this process, which costs a couple of dollars per hole, effectively extends the life of the rail by up to five to 10 times. Okay, well, many thanks, Gary. I don't know if there's any other questions from the public. Uh, if there aren't, I will hand over to Sonia to have the ending words. Muchísimas gracias, Victoria, a todos los oradores del día de hoy. Thank you so much. Victoria and all of the speakers today. It is a pleasure as every year working with you, introducing to you the latest news from the British industry, everything that has to do with consulting at different products and what the British government is doing. We want to thank all panelists and participants. We expect this has been of your interest. Please don't hesitate in contacting us. We will let you have via email those that won the raffle today uh, for you to get hold of the books. Thank you so much. We will see you next time. <laughs>